Your travels are over. Hello, welcome back to Marathon Man, where I'm going through Doctor Who from the very beginning, and you join me as we say goodbye to the second Doctor, and the show changes forever. A couple of marathons ago, I was going through a fairly tumultuous time, as in, like, my marriage had ended and I had to stay for a time on a uh, very kind friend's sofa. Uh, and so the marathon was something of a, something of like a, a, a refuge. It was really nice, a uh, nice escape. Um, and he came in one time. Uh, I was at season, season five at this point, so I was deep in recon territory. This was before the animations. And my friend came in and found me on his sofa watching... Uh, I think it was the Abominable Snowman, and he was absolutely fascinated by the fact that they'd recreated the missing episodes this way, and even fascinated by the fact that there even were missing episodes. And he quite liked what he saw, to be honest. But he was only familiar with like the revival of Doctor Who, so he started asking me a lot of questions. And when I told him that you don't actually find out the Doctor's a Time Lord until the end of the sixth season, it blew his mind that such restraint was shown not to explain the Doctor's origin somewhat until that point. So much so that he said to me, I can really see myself getting into Doctor Who now. Now that didn't happen, but it really made me realise how incidental all of that stuff is at this point in the show. Like, it doesn't matter where he's from or what species he is. None of the 50 stories up until this point have suffered because we don't know that. And for a show actually named after the mystery of its central character, I always marvel at how little that actually does matter. And, paradoxically, how important it is in the show working. Six years of not knowing isn't actually six years of waiting to find out. But, nevertheless, we do find it out here. And even though none of that has really mattered up until this point, and it's all been incidental and in the background, the War Games makes changes to the show that feel seismic. The term Time Lord is coined, and the Doctor actually tells us why he left his own planet. We even get to go there at the end, but crucially, some mystery is still maintained. We still don't actually find out its name, for example. And as with the show up until this point, this is key to why the story succeeds. It may remove some mystery from Doctor Who, but it adds some more. We've peeled away a layer, we haven't got all the answers, and learning that the Doctor is a Time Lord doesn't diminish him in any way when you consider that there's still so much that we're not told. It certainly asks more questions than it answers, and having not learned anything for six years beyond meeting Susan, seeing the monk and hearing snippets here and there about the Doctor's family, being presented with what the War Games presents us with is exactly the right amount. It's tantalising stuff. In episode 8, the Doctor and the War Chief have a truly electric scene. Having already given me chills when they recognise each other earlier in the story, particularly because both react so viscerally, they share a fantastic conversation which is exactly what I'm talking about when I say that it adds more mystery. The War Chief tells the Doctor that despite him having changed his appearance, the first time, by the way, this has been mentioned, I believe, since not long after the regeneration, he still knows who the Doctor is. Now that scene says a lot, but it suggests so much more. The Doctor was known on his home planet. Why? It keeps giving the viewer reason to keep watching, but we all know that knowing who the Doctor is and all of his secrets isn't actually key to enjoying Doctor Who. It's about so much more than that. And while The War Games does expand the mythology really skillfully, it also doesn't forget to be an entertaining story in its own right. We have precious little of Troughton in Earth's history, and even though this technically doesn't truly count, to have him land in what is ostensibly World War I on Earth is most welcome. And it's also slightly stretching the definition of history too. We're now further away from the War Games than it was from the 1917 First World War setting. The upcoming Beatles episode in Shooty's first season is further away from us now than the 1917 First World War setting was from when the War Games was made and, and broadcast. So this would have been living memory for some people, and this has the added effect of being attention-grabbing from the very start. 
The crew land in the thick of it straight away. And yeah, Jamie does look like a deserter and the Doctor is mistaken for a German spy. And okay, yeah, there's a lot of running around and getting captured, but it is wildly entertaining. Like, the Doctor and Zoe blagging their way into the prison is thoroughly entertaining. The whole thing has an intriguing plot and builds that intrigue really very nicely indeed. It's well acted, well written, well directed. It comes packed with all manner of different ingredients and it ends up feeling really rich and dense. It builds so nicely that beginning episode 5 feels like making a start on episode 3. Having such wonderful cliffhangers helps this, but what really aids this story's progression is how it throws curveballs in occasionally to make sense of later. We're in the First World War when suddenly a red coat shows up from 1745 and also in how it establishes a hierarchy of power. When we twig that not all is as it seems, we're still under the assumption that General Smythe is our villain. Then the War Chief shows up. Then we discover he defers to the Warlord. Then the Time Lords swoop in with all their might and overshadow them all. The threat keeps getting bigger, certainly for the Doctor. And it's simple stuff, but it's so very effective. In a way, it rolls together almost all of Doctor Who. You've got futury sci-fi and then a couple of different historicals peppered in there. And because of that, combined with the like immense threat and revelations that we get about the Doctor's backstory, it does feel like this could serve perfectly well as the finale to the entire show. It's a fitting way to end an era, certainly, but it... It's also a fitting way to end the show if that were needed. We find out that the Doctor is a fugitive and he's caught and returned home. There is a sense of finality about it. Your travels are over. Troughton is suitably grave about the whole affair and affords it the weight it deserves. His has been a bumbling Doctor on the surface, but we know that something formidable lies beneath. And it's wonderful when he displays it. He loses his rag during Smythe's phony court-martial, which is mere suggestion for what is to happen come the story's end. When he argues with his own people while he's on trial, he is firing on all cylinders. More interesting, though, is that scene I mentioned with the War Chief. When they get down to chatting and the War Chief reveals that he knows who the Doctor is, Troughton does something very interesting indeed. He drops the Doctor's front completely. Not in favour of anger or righteous indignation as usual when the Doctor stops pretending to be a dope. No, he just realises that there's no point in pretending when the person he's talking to already knows exactly who he is. It's almost as if, in that scene, he becomes Hartnell again for a very brief time. I had every right to leave. One of the reasons Trenton brings his A-game is because he's surrounded by so many great performances. The War Chief is no question formidable, but it's Philip Maddock as the Warlord who, as he did with his previous turn in the Crotons, takes the award for most outstanding guest turn in this story. The Warlord is referenced a few times and is a foreboding, unseen presence, and when he does eventually show up, he's smaller and quieter than we might have expected, but my word is he a force to be reckoned with. He's so quiet for most of the time, and it's that quietness that works and makes him so menacing. And he's, for my money, the best. He usurps Kevin Stoney as Tobias Vaughan for the best villain we've had in the show up until this point. It's absolutely <laughs> phenomenal. Maddock is absolutely outstanding when the Warlord is raging against the Time Lords, and it really helps this story to keep building momentum even as it's winding down. Which isn't to knock the War Chief, by the way. He is an excellent presence as well. And something about this viewing struck me. So, there's been fan debate for a really, 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 really long time about whether or not the War Chief is, in fact, the Master. I was never truly fussed either way, to be honest. I used to choose to think that he was a separate character, but if you thought he was the Master, then that's fine. It's just that on this viewing, I don't know, I could feel myself being swayed to the other side. Again, it's ambiguous enough for us to draw our own conclusions. Like, the Master hadn't been created at this point, so it can't be that he was intended to be that character. And moreover, when the Master was created, he wasn't recognised by the Doctor as the War Chief, so it's safe to assume they're intended to be different characters. But, for me, the reading that he's the Master just worked for me on this particular viewing. I saw it way more clearly than before, basically. They obviously know each other. And the War Chief allying himself with an alien race with a view to conquering them isn't exactly outside of the Master's MO. Plus, they are both renegade Time Lords. Like I said, mileage can vary on this, and mine has even varied from my own this time, so that's how much mileage can vary. 
And sadly, we have to bid farewell to Jamie and Zoe. Now, Zoe became such an integral part of the crew in such a short space of time that I think I've got to concede at this point, they're my favourite TARDIS team. And in their final story together, they get so much good stuff. Jamie pretends to be a resistance leader at one point, which is just great. And even greater is that it is actually Zoe behind the ruse. And um, when the Doctor pretends to process Jamie, Jamie's shrewd enough to go along with it, but still playful enough to put the Doctor on the spot. This gang is the best gang. Zoe gets her fair share of solid gold moments. She attempts to break the Doctor out of prison and later knocks out the prison chief too because the Doctor's ruse is both taking too long and about to be found out. She is bloody brilliant. When she and Jamie decide to stay with the Doctor to face the Time Lords, it shows exactly how strong their bond has become. But it's the man himself to whom I bid the saddest goodbye. He's been a fantastic Doctor, and at his beginning, that was against the odds. He may not have had the most consistent era, but then neither did Hartnell, and Troughton himself has been effortlessly wonderful throughout it all. Here is no exception. There is no sense at all of him working his notice. And while, yeah, I think that might have been true of Hartnell, Hartnell was sort of forced out. And that permeated into the atmosphere of those final episodes. Here, this is a man who has chosen to depart, and he performs his swan song with no ill feeling or bitterness whatsoever. And that gives it a sense of... That gives it a sense of triumph, even when the Doctor resolutely kind of loses. The gravity of his having to call the Time Lords feels incredibly heavy. It's all over his face. Bringing peace at the cost of his own freedom doesn't just raise the stakes as high as they have been for ages. They also show, once and for all, just how heroic the Doctor is, which is most welcome after his throwing the Ice Warriors into the sun quite recently. After all, the Doctor would rather be shot by VR than wait for the Time Lords. Then you will just have to kill me, Mr. Villa. Well, Mr. Doctor, that is just what I will do! Then he is sent away, exiled to Earth, and regeneration forced upon him. And it is sad to say goodbye to Jamie, Zoe, and the second Doctor. But this feels like something so much more exciting than the Tenth Planet did. And it doesn't just feel like it's a satisfying conclusion to Troughton's era. It feels like this is a satisfying conclusion to the whole show up until this point. As a result, after 253 episodes, we now forge on into something completely new. Your travels are over. So many to choose from. I know it's Troughton's swan song, but I may have to give it to Philip Maddock. He is amazing. Well, it's a struggle to choose one, but I think it might have to be VR shooting at the floor and extras still getting hit. It's an uncharacteristically sloppy incident in an otherwise juggernaut of a story. As ever, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then you know how YouTube works. Please do hit the thumbs up and share it around. I would be super grateful. It really helps no end. And what do you think of the War Games? Does Trent go out on a high? Or at 10 episodes, is it unforgivably bloated? And will you even miss him? And, dare I ask, do you think the War Chief is the same character as the Master? Let me know in the comments below and I'll see you back here soon for a recap of Season 6. So if you don't want to miss that, hit the subscribe button, clang the cloister bell, and I will see you soon.